What up my freaks, Ruinous Insight here, welcoming you to part one of a brand new modded Total Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires campaign. You guys overwhelmingly voted for him in the community poll, and so, the true Phoenix King and daddy to all the Dark Elves, Malekith himself shall lead the Druki in this SFO Grimhammer 3 playthrough. But before the Witch King demonstrates that it makes absolute sense that he was right about those High Elves in the end times, a few quick notes. If you enjoy this content and you want to see it updated on the regular, don't forget to drop your likes and comments for the algorithm down below, as scheduling is tied to engagement. If you want to see more stuff, check out my live streams on Twitch. I'll be doing Everspace 2 uh, this week on a live stream. And if you want to support the channel, consider purchasing games through my affiliate links in the description below. Little shill moment. A last a huge shout out to Venris and the SFO mod team for for their amazing work and as always the biggest shout out to you guys for all your comments and support many of you know i do youtube for fun after work and your comments keep this fun and keep the channel alive now we're going to take a quick look at the faction and difficulty setup especially as i imagine it changes with sfo um, but do keep uh, do feel free to skip to gameplay if you're not interested anyway glory to malekith sacrifices and unique slave buildings so he has a little bit of a different slave economy than everybody else but i guess we'll have to wait until we start playing to actually see that he has an increase by or two allegiance points and diplomatic relations with other Dark Elves, which is pretty fantastic because our goal is going to be to gather the whole family together and uh, play around with them. Possibly not in the same manner as we'd play around with Marathi, but we'll play it by ear. Uh, next up, loyalty plus two for new recruits. I've never really cared for this because it's rare for loyalty to be an issue, but I suppose we'll have to see. Uh, upkeep a reduction for Black Guard, Dread Spears, Bleak Swords, and Dark Shards. The best than the worst, basically, but not the middling stuff. Good for the early game and good for the late game, so nothing to complain about. And then unique units. Manticore Lords, Shadowfire Guard, ooh, and High Elf units after taking the Shrine of Asurian. Oh, I can't wait for that. Uh, a little bit of an echo of the end times for Malekith, I suppose, and, oh man, this is gonna be fun. Can't wait to get to Ulthuan and start using additional units. More unit variety, people. You gotta love it. Anyway, Lord Effects, Control and Construction costs bonuses, because Malekith is apparently a good governor, or everybody's too afraid of him to, uh, you know, say anything else. And enemy leadership reduction minus 10, which is not insignificant, and we may want to lean further into this to screw with the leadership of enemy armies. That's about it for Malekith's faction and such, so we're going to go to the difficulty settings now. I've decided on going with the 150 endgame difficulty, as I think that's the sweet spot. Early warning timers at 10, trigger on turn 100. I usually do turn 110, but I'm going to do a little bit earlier uh, this time around. And for the scenario, this was actually a hard pick because, honestly, other than Grumbrindle being nearby, there's nobody really near Malekith in terms of the endgame scenarios. I decided to go with the Wild Hunt, so we'll fight the Sisters of Twilight, and hopefully by the time that the endgame scenario rolls around, we'll be closing in past Ulthuan towards the main Wood Elf areas, and thus we'll be able to fight them there. Because, yeah, all the others are really all way too far away from where Malekith starts. And I believe that's about it. We're gonna go very hard, very hard, because once again, I think that's the sweet spot, and I have nothing left to say, so let's get to it. All bow before the Witch King. Alrighty, an elf of few words, apparently, at least at this time. Here we go, Malekith on the field, and we got a little uh, clan septic Skaven army before us. I'm really excited about this because I have not played Malekith in absolute ages since the second game, in fact. And his starting position, which I used to think was one of the worst start positions, not Malekith specifically, but anybody around here, basically, because they're all kind of samey. I used to really not like starting here. Not because of the difficulty so much much as the fact that, it once again, it feels like all the factions uh, uh, have kind of the same fights. But it's changed so much that it should be pretty uh, uh, different. As for how they play, we have the Slaves and the Sacrificial Rites, um, but we have borrowed the Diktat system and the Slave Diktat system from uh, the Chaos Dwarf, so it's similar to that, which will be pretty interesting. Construction cost reduction and growth, which is nice. Control increases and just money. Although... 
1500 money for every 10 turns is going to be basically useless in the late game, so it'll probably be these two, unless we use the income from slaves. Anyway, in addition to that, we have the sacrifices to Mathland to get black arcs up and running, and we'll definitely be wanting those, especially for annoying of the uh, Nagareth faction, whoever else has a coastline nearby, and then construct the Shrine of the Widowmaker to get the Shrine of Cain and the Sword of Cain, which I'm sure Malekith will want. Chosen of Cain, as he is, or Avatar, or whatnot. I... I take it Malice gets the Warp Sword, I don't remember. Uh, the Warp Sword of Cain, I mean. As opposed to the Sword of Cain. Anyway, we also have Glory to Malekith, which gives us specific buffs for a few turns. Ten turns, I believe, yep. And via the, uh... Glory to my or Witch King's authority thing, uh, but the important stuff isn't so much these buffs, which no, don't get me wrong, aren't horrible or anything, um, but rather this. Drew key. Each subjugation require Witch King's authority it costs uh, increases by 100 with every confederation. So this brings our friends or our family into the fold. Marathi, Cronhelebron, Lokir, Malice, and Rakarth are all here, but more importantly, it brings back the faction if it gets destroyed, which means we basically have a guarantee of eventually being able to subjugate and get them all on our team. And if we can do one of these early on, we would be able to essentially fight on two fronts at the same time, which I'm really excited about. Imagine we're, I don't know, 20 turns in, and then we subjugate, for example, Lokir all the way back here, and then start fighting on this side and on this side. I think that would be pretty fantastic. Although I do also think that we need to build, allow him to build up anyway. I'm letting my exciting or excitement rather get ahead of me a little bit, so let's jump into our first cinematic battle. Gonna pop into Druki first strike stance here to allow us to vanguard deploy the army, and hit Mr. Scabbers! Alright, Malekith. Uh, obviously, the enemy has no chance with all those Skaven slaves, but it's the first battle, and these are always cinematic worthy. Here we go. <laughs> misery for all misery for all that's what you say to lift up your troops before the battle eh Malekith you are so edgy I love you so <laughs> that's fantastic imagine your general is just like misery for all and then the troops are like yeah N not, not us right <laughs> oh that is so Malekith. But yeah, you got to love this guy. I mean, look at that fantastic, over-the-top edgy armor. Uh, can, uh, I don't think anybody has better armor than Malekith does at the current time and what we've got in terms of uh, legendary lords. And you gotta love his character in general as well. I do think that he's probably one of the best written, or at the very least most compelling, of the villains in the Warhammer fantasy setting. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love me some Nagash or Archeon, but they're not complex characters uh, by any means. So, uh, yeah, Malekith with his, uh, with all the stuff that he's gone through, with the PTSD from being broiled alive in the flames of Asurian, and the 7,000 years of non-stop psychological torture by Marathi. Uh, he's, he's a pretty interesting guy. Evil, uh, but interesting. And uh, uh, yeah, I do think that he shares some characteristics with Malice Darkblade, that implacable will, the refusal to give up, and the dogged determination. And uh, that is, I suppose, one of the best features of uh, characteristics for the Dark Elves that uh, they uh, uh, they represent. Though, I, though Malekith is more of a true, like, genuine villain, whereas Malice is more of an anti-villain because he actually has a good characteristics to him that other Dark Elves don't share. Anyway, uh, I don't know how this first battle turned into a character study for a Malekith, but uh, here we go. The battle's about to begin. We are well, just marching directly towards the enemy army because they're mostly Skaven slaves and clan rats, and uh, they are of no concern to our basic troops, and especially not to Malekith or the Black Guard. Malekith is just going to saunter Mal 
menacingly through the battle lines, ignoring the Skaven slaves and marching towards the enemy lord as it would be... Uh, it's beneath him to wet the blood of his sword with something like Skaven slaves. In the meantime, the uh, main battle lines have clashed together, and it looks like our Dread Spears and our Bleak Swords, together with our Black Guard, are facing off against some uh, clan rats. So it looks like the uh, Skaven slave spears are going to, or, or Skaven slaves in general, are going to rush on out of there from uh, the Black Guard. We've also used a chill wind to decent effect over in the forest here, where a couple of our own units were holding off the uh, uh, holding off the Skaven, and it looks like the single use of chill wind essentially forced both of those armies, or both of those units, rather, to break. We are also trying to target the Skaven slave slingers, as they're, they're probably the most threatening unit on the field, other than the enemy Gracier, and uh, are generally threatening to our unshielded Dark Shards, so thus our Dark Shards are focusing them down, and our Chariots are going to focus down the rest. Malak is going to go after the enemy Gracier himself in a nice little duel. Of course, the enemy Lord stands absolutely no chance here. Nice little duel, but I don't imagine it'll be a long one. I wish that there were, like, uh, sort of, like, armor values to where a unit uh, wouldn't uh, take, uh, like, blood damage until, I don't know, uh, the enemy has d damaged the armor significantly. Anyway, it looks like the enemy lord scurries away, both literally and figuratively as scurry away. It does activate for those Skaven. Otherwise, the bounce power is about 90% in our favor, and this is the first battle. It's impossible to lose it. It's designed that way. So, uh, will the battle will be ours fairly shortly. I'm also also using a bunch of uh, graphical changes, uh, namely some... Well, I'm not going to go through them, but uh, you guys let me know how the graphics are in this particular case as compared to what uh, the graphics look like usually during my Let's Plays, or for, at least for those of you who have watched other Let's Plays on this channel. Uh, I will probably be fiddling with them at least a little bit in this campaign. Anyway, back to the battle. At least one major part of fighting Skaven is the fact that they will route and rally, route and rally, round and round they go, like uh, like a rat in a wheel, I suppose. And uh, thus they will be coming back here. Dark Shard's going to let those crossbow bolts hit one of those units, whereas the other will colli or collide with our uh, uh, with our Dread Spears here, but probably not for long. Not Dread Spears and Bleak Swords, I should say. All right, and that leadership reduction really working for us here as the enemy smashes into us and then runs away once more. Another chill wind following up that with the Malak of casting. And then as the enemies run, they will take many a crossbow bolt to the back. And with that, I do believe the rest of the army has shattered and the battle is indeed ours. Certainly not a difficult one, but not to worry. We'll find a proper big battle cinematic debut for Malak after at some point this episode, I'm sure. Uh, we are going to try to give chase as best we can because we need to acquire as many slaves as we can to operate our diktats, but just like the Chaos dwar Dwarfs, I imagine. Um, but it looks like only two of our units can chase. Uh, the Skaven are generally faster moving infantry than ours is by a fairly considerable amount, 47 versus... Uh, 35 move speed, but the Cold One Chariots can chase, and surprisingly, perhaps, the Black Guard of Nagarond can as well. They're actually slower than our other infantry units. However, by virtue of the fact that they have Cavalry Bane on them, it seems that the acceleration reduction that this thing does actually slows the enemy enough so that the Black Guard can give chase, which is interesting. Uh, and will be quite useful in the future as we get more and more Black Guard of Nagarond in uh, Malekith's army. Anyway, uh, they can continue that, but we're going to speed it up through the rest of this as we don't really need to see it. We have other battles to get to this episode and ground to cover and uh, whatnot. All right, and you guys let me know about the graphics. Alrighty, there we go, and ooh, so we get Witch King's authority from winning battles as well. So winning 50 battles will put us up to 100 and allow us to uh, 
confederate immediately. Swell, 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 swell. I'd also love to build up all those uh, other areas of the map. Anyway, well done, Amalekith. You don't have your black dragon yet, but uh, you hardly need him uh, for now. Now, in terms of what we want out of this, murdered captives gives us a unit XP and a little bit of weapon strength, but I think uh, we're gonna need those slaves to pop up those diktats as fast as possible. So enslave. Alright, like so, and an enchanted shield for Malekith. Now let's see, now, Nagar- oh right, they changed Nagaron to be a two territory, huh? A two uh, settlement territory, which is kind of bizarre, to be perfectly honest. I'm not entirely sure what the uh, indecision behind that was. I guess we are going to try to be moving down here. Now, are we at war with the chaos forces that start near to us? Uh, no, we're at war with Clan Septic, and we have not discovered Grumbrindle yet, and we're probably going to have to fight him, at least to some degree. A little bit unfortunate. I do wish that there was a sort of dilemma or something like that that would allow us to try to align with uh, Malekith's former best friend, and I guess in the end times still kind of best friend, uh, but uh, yeah, oh well, not a big deal I guess. I really do like Malekith's character, and at least in terms of the like actual character of him, character study, whatever. Uh, Harkaldra. Do we need to bother fighting this, or is this auto-resolvable? I mean, they don't even have a lord here. I feel like we can auto-resolve this. Decisive victory with low casualties. That's just auto-resolve this. I don't see the need. A uh, little bit of damage, but over two turns, I imagine we should still be able to heal up. Malekith gets a little bit of XP and a weak little sword. We are going to just occupy it because we don't want to destabilize our own primary province. Serve your cause. Gain experience over time, my lord. Ye I'm aware. I'm aware. I thought I turned those off. I'll, I'll deal with it later. Uh, Iron Foothills is complete. Okay, so what we want to do here is, let's see, we have 608 slaves, so we can pop the Diktat. We definitely want to go for slave drive pretty much immediately. I do want to see, wait, where are the slaves actually? Hmm. So we have Glory to Malekith here, Sword of Cain, Rights, Technology, and Diplomacy. Wait, so is the slave system now only for Diktats? As in, unlike the Chaos Dwarfs, we don't keep them in a particular location. A little bit odd, but whatever. Uh, control plus 8 and Campaign Movement Reduction. Upkeep reduction in our own territory, but we won't have Malekith in this province much longer. Chance of plague spreading... Uh, well, the Skaven will come here, but... Uh, oh! Wait, we can rush buildings with this? Oh, that's interesting. That's real interesting. Slaves minus 50 per turn, but rush construction slave cost minus 20, eh? I wonder what the general cost is. Either way, I think we're going to start off with the... Uh, uh, the construction cost reduction diktat and growth, so plus 50 and minus 10%. 475 slaves. This didn't actually change our income in any way. And uh, then we are going to build you, 1600 cost, and yeah, 450 slaves have built that instantly. Would it have been better to do that instead? Maybe? I'm not sure. Three turns isn't that big a deal, and we do have ten turns of this diktat up and running, so who knows. Now, we will need money everywhere, as fast as we can. While I'd love to get growth, I think it's the slave income and... Wait, don't we have another income building, like a non-slave income building? Or is where I think you have another faction. I guess this is the best way to get money? Alright, so I guess we'll go for uh, and this then. It's actually really not all that much, but we'll want to get another army up and running as fast as possible to make a lot of... Uh, and to take a lot of territory. So I guess we'll go for Artisan's House here. We will also, I don't think we're going to switch to increase slave production quota at the current time. Really, anything that uh, causes us to get reduction is probably not the best thing in the world. Hmm. Reduction in slave numbers, I mean. Oh, let's go for Read Dark Portents for now for the campaign movement range, even though we'll only have one turn to benefit from it when we go here. But we can't go to Ultra of Ultimate Darkness right now anyway, so that's fine. We'll also want to fill up on Dark Shards. Let's go for two for now, just so that we have a little bit of money remaining. And let's pick our first tech, which is going to be... Let's see, Army Ability, Bloody Sacrifice, probably not going to be using that anytime soon. Additional effects unlocked for Barracks Chain... Uh, founded on Tyranny, Growth, always nice to have. And melee attack for the weak basic units. Yeah, you know what, let's go for the weak melee basic unit attacks. 
Yeah, and then we'll go through Founded on Tyranny right after that. But uh, if we'll be relying on these guys in the early game, we'll want to make them do stuff. And then let's check out Diplomacy. So Grand, Klar Karand, and Karand Kar are all willing to trade. I, I really dislike, you know, doing like-on-like -like fights, so we're gonna have alliances with them, plus we have bonuses to them anyway, so why not? Balance offer, give us your money as well. Why not? That's actually probably gonna be problematic for our allies here, but no. Uh, Karant Kar, you're up next, though you're gonna get destroyed by Nagrith, because I think you always get destroyed by Nagrith. Give us your money as well. Hey, it's AI money, it's not gonna make good use of that money anyway. And then we'll do the same thing here. Swell, and you all better not be fighting amongst yourselves. Okay, now we have a decent amount of cash. We could actually build a third a unit of uh, Dark Shards by virtue of it. Hmm. Yeah, you know what, why not? Why not? And we have three turns to get it back anyway, and Duquette's gonna take a while to get Regiments of Renown, and I believe that's it. I also forgot to take a look at what the Sorceress has and Knowledgeable. Well, I guess to start off, it's not the worst thing in the world, but we'll have to replace her with somebody with a uh, better effect afterwards. Malekith, you also have your first point, which means we're obviously going to take War Leader, but at rank 12, so we can't do it. I just want to see what it gives us, your unique chain. So, massive increase to income from sacking settlements, eh? Maybe we combine that with Infamous Raider and then actually make use of it. Uh, we have Lord Recruit Rank plus 4 Attrition Reduction. Oh, that's swell. And then we have Magic Item Drop Chance. Alright, some decent stuff. Some decent stuff, but no direct buffs to Black Guards, surprisingly. Hmm, that's kind of interesting. Oh wait, do we not get... Uh, do we not get Kuran Darkhand? Maybe we don't get him. Well, Root Marcher first. You'd think he'd be a legendary hero, but apparently not. Uh, recruit hero, and yeah, we don't have uh, we don't have available any of them. Well, I guess we'll see. Uh, let's end the turn. Maybe there's a dilemma to recruit Kuran. And to the altar of ultimate darkness we go. I guess we'll get a few more basic troops before we hit it, but it's uh, full of Skaven anyway. That'll probably put us in range of the Mung. And then we'll have to ask ourselves whether we head southward to Grimbrindle or whether we deal with that. Uh, SFO mod menu, thanks. We're not going to be de dealing with it at the current time. Let's continue moving up instead like so. And what the heck is this? Galak Blood Gorge. We should probably make sure that you die. Uh, do you have any stances here? Let's just double check now. Damn. I was hoping he had a recruitment stance like in camp, but apparently the Dark Elves don't have that, but that's what Black Arcs are for. So you stay in our province to heal up, then we'll get you, let's say, a couple more Dread Spears, because they're superior to uh, Bleak Swords, like so. And that should be sufficient. I wonder if Sign Surge is going to come down here, but, uh, well, probably shouldn't be a big deal. We could build outposts with our allies and... Oh, we start off with a military alliance with Hag Grief. Oh, I didn't even realize that. That's also swell, but I don't think we're going to bother with this yet. Mostly because if there are units that we want to get from him, we'll want to get them later when he actually has a uh, higher a number of them available. Uh, in terms of what we got to do here, it is nothing for another two turns. And maybe I should have rushed it after all, but whatever, not a big deal. Mm, we can save the... Slaves to rush the next level, which is going to be more difficult. And I guess we're going to end another turn. We're going to head towards the altar here. And we do have something that we can build here. Income from all buildings, all regions in this province. Experience gain faction-wide. And more attrition reduction. Oh, that's that's swell. Huh. So I take it Malekith is designed in such a way that uh, he can basically be immune to attrition. Uh, Galag Blood Gorge. I wonder, if we attack you, are you going to be able to move far enough away from us? It's decent likelihood that you will. I'd actually, I'd really like to destroy the beastman. I really don't want the beastman nearby. And ah, sign surge, you're moving around. But he's probably too weak to even threaten Harkaldra, so we probably don't care about that. Uh, let's try to attack the beastman. Fireball for you. Oh wait. Hmm. Nah, we want to get, we want to get your spells up and running. So let's do that. Malekith, attack this. Uh, don't call allies to help. I'm a little bit concerned about Malice deciding to cancel the agreement. And there's Grombi. Will you be able to move far enough away? Maybe. E Malekith? Oh, you can't move any more forward because of the Skaven in here. 
Oh well, might have been able to catch this guy, but uh, hey, who knows, maybe we can intercept him. Alter of Ultimate Darkness. We can not immediately take it, because... Huh. Malekith does not have the Siege Attacker trait. I thought all Legendary Lords were given the Siege Attacker trait. Wow, I did not know that. Well, that's irritating. We're going to need to quickly build the... Uh, uh, build the Reaper Bolt Thrower building. Don't want to be manually doing that. Now, Grombi, how much do you hate us? Oh, not as much as I thought. Minus 60 is really not that bad. Huh. Hmm. I don't have time for words. Hmm. Okay, he's not gonna join war against them. Yeah, let, me, let me just think about this for a second. What? Uh, I was thinking we take the Altar of Ultimate Darkness and trade it, but no, we can't give up the attrition reduction, can we? Hmm. If there was a way to get Malekith on best friend terms with Grombi again, or Snorri, I should say, I would do it, but it doesn't look to be all that possible. Oh, well, in the turn. Huh, wait, and didn't Galag Blood Gorge attack Altar of Ultimate Darkness? Are you telling me that the Beastmen have the Siege Attacker trait, but we don't? Seems a bit off. And, ah, damn, he did manage to run away from us. Oh, well, not a big deal. Uh, what do we have here in terms of difficulty? That, that it's, This is garbage. We're not fighting this. It's a waste of our time. All right, but we are going to occupy the place. Nice. And, hey, a Warrior Bane. Swell. Malakiv is currently using, what, the Shrieking Blade? No Gold Sigil Sword. We'll put the Warrior Bane on you, Hagren, for now. And then we'll head down to Rakdo Gorge and Shroktak Mountain instead. I mean, if we were to give Grombi... Both Rakto Gorge and Shroktak, man, but take the Temple of Cain and start fighting uh, Torox and whoever out here. This might actually be a decent chance to get Grimbrindle on our side as a permanent ally. And then if he protects us from anybody south, like the elves or something, we could move up north to attack the Mung and Valkia before Valkia gets strong. I've never done such a thing before, but I like the idea. Uh, let's get the Sawyer here. Ah, more construction cost reduction. Isn't that lovely? And what else can we get here? Hmm. I'd love to upgrade to the next tier before the Diktat runs out, but we will need to have money for it. Uh, speaking of money, I guess we need to keep building the money chain everywhere. Not much of a choice in it, I think. I mean, could go early shades as well, but their cost is pretty prohibitive, and I think we're better off staying with the uh, weaker units. I would like to get some Dark Riders, though, because the ability to chase down units will increase our uh, capability of acquiring slave units, which is much needed. And, ooh, hello. Oh, Manticore Lords. Oh, I thought that this would, that would meant, like, lords, as in lords that ride Manticores, but it looks like it's a legendary unit. Oh, fantastic. A personal guard for Mali. I like to see that. Hmm. Bloodrack Medusa, Bloodrack Shrine. I'm just double checking that there's no units I'm not familiar with in here, but it looks like we don't have them. What are Shadow Fire Guard then? I guess we'll find them eventually from somewhere. Maybe it's something we get from Nagareth's territories. Oh, either way, money for now. Money for now. So artisan's house and outpost available. Not right now. We're gonna double check diplomacy. Trying to kick this off as fast as we can. Ah, Harganath. Yes, please. Trade agreement and tiny amounts of cash. Thank you, thank you. And Clark Caron, let's go for the military access so we don't piss you off when we inevitably go through your territory. And I believe that's all the diplo we can do. We're definitely not piecing out with Septic over here, however. All right, minus forty-five. Depends on if he declares war on us or not. Now, can we build any basics here? We can build more Dread Spears. Uh, do we need more Dread Spears? We can get more Dread Spears. We do want to have a full stack available. If our army is too weak, then it's more likely that one of these factions declare war on us. Oh, Grombi! He moved right up to us in March stance as well. <laughs> Damn, that's tempting. Do we risk destroying him? Yes, it might be better to destroy him, but man, I'm so tempted to try to align with him. How much would you want for this? 3658. It's not horrible. I gotta try this, guys. I have to. I have to. It's a loreful. What sort of loreful? Uh, in the sense that uh, it's at least 
possible. This is an insane amount of money that we'd be throwing away if this doesn't work in the early game especially, but I'm just so tempted by the concept. It tickles me. Uh, let's also upgrade Hark Cauldra. Do we, oh, are you telling me we don't have enough to upgrade both of them? Talk if you must. It won't change 3661. Your you know what? I'm, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Horrible idea or not. And it's not like we need these tiny little provinces anyway, so if he can have Recto Gorge, I'm perfectly fine with it. Uh, anyway, you're gonna move up through Recto Gorge, I guess, because I'm not sure we'd otherwise be able to reach the place. But we don't want to suffer attrition, so go along the road. Like so. I also do have to wonder where those beastmen went and whether they are going to go loop around Harkaldra. But there's not much we can do about that, and ooh, looks like we have another cinematic battle before us, as this guy will probably defend Rakdo Gorge, and I do imagine it has walls there. For those unfamiliar with SFO, uh, SFO has a pretty big difference in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of what fights are like. You know what, let's take the, the mana instead. Uh, what fights are like in settlements, they're a lot tougher, so... Exciting times. Uh, battle, vigor loss, speed, leadership when in foreign territory and founded on tyranny. Hmm. You know, I'm gonna go with marching toward the speed on the relatively slow basic infantry is pretty important. Uh, but we'll go for founded on tyranny right after that, I swear. I swear. Alrighty, end the turn. And let's hit Rakdo Gorge. Alright, come on, Grombrindal. Don't declare war on us right now. Remember your best. Do you remember the good times we had before Malekith betrayed your people and you and made you so angry and vengeful that you rose from the grave? Remember that? <laughs> Alrighty, let's see. Oh, and it looks like Skittice is actually going to move away from Rakdo Gorge. Surprising. I was expecting him to defend it. Close victory. Ooh. Probably because of the Plague Claw catapults. Uh, Alright, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna besiege him. I like so. And we're gonna see. Maybe these guys are gonna be willing to fight us in the field. I don't think so, but the possibility exists. I doubt that Grombi is gonna help us, but who knows. Is he at war with anybody else? No. If he was going to start fighting the Hmong, I would have, uh... Uh, I would have helped him with that. There's also the Ogres here, and I do have to wonder whether we can ally with them. Though I wonder if Grombi is gonna fight them. Oh, hello, Torox. Uh, he's definitely going to attack us soon, and he's besieged Hag Grief. Well, you know what? That's actually kind of good for us. I would rather take the Dark Crag and use it for our own purposes than leave it to Torox. Yeah. It'll be faster than having uh, Clark Caron alive. This looks, is this Clark Caron's only territory? It is, so they'll be destroyed shortly. But you know what? If we can move back around at this time, that would be great. Though I hope that the blood ground from this doesn't screw us over. We'll find out in a sec. Building upgrade available. Yes to more construction cost reduction. Yes to more money. And that's it. And the turn. Besiege Rakdo Gorge. I can't believe we don't have Siege Attacker on Malekith of all people. He seems like a Siege Attacker to me. And Clan Septic will, in fact, attack Grumbrinda. He's already helping us. <laughs> Oh, all right. And decisive victory, low casualties again. Man, I was hoping for an epic cinematic fight, but honestly, without the uh, the other enemies, it's going to be not much of a point to it. I guess we're going to have to save the cinematic fight for Torox here. You know what? And ooh, hello there, Galak. You could be another potential cinematic. You know what? I guess we're going to get a lord up and running here. Shadows of Nagaron, what do you do? You buff with armor and melee attack for shades and dark riders. It's okay. Nothing crazy. What do you do? Campaign movement range and construction cost for cult of pleasure and death hags. Eh. Strong and tactician and supreme sorceress cruel raiding experience. I just want to find something that's nice. Oh, a harpy lord. You know what? That might not be too bad as a, a follower for a. Uh, uh, follower for Malekith's army, as in follow him around as a support army. Potentially. First strike and tyrant. Huh, another leadership reduction. You know, I like the idea of this harpy lord. In the lore of dark magic, eh? I think we'll do that. Supreme sorceress of dark. It's expensive sorceress of dark. You're gonna get on the field, you're all gonna help defend the altar of ultimate darkness. Uh, Malekith, we're going to auto-resolve this, with Grimbrindle's help as well. Yeah, they, they have no chance. But we shouldn't even get hurt because Grimbrindle is here. And we'll occupy the place. And hey, a Tormentor sword! Okay, Malekith, I'm going to switch you to the Tormentor sword. 
and gold sigil sword can be going to somebody else. Then, hmm, hopefully he doesn't take Temple of Cain. I'm hoping he takes Shrock Tech Mount. Also, anything here? No, no, no. But I'm willing to bet that uh, Recto Gorge will be worth something to you. Uh, do we want to upgrade anything? No, and we got ten turns until we can upgrade the Nagaron Dark Tower. All right, fine. And then in that light, we are going to level up Malekith. Let's get you Chill Wind buffed, because you're going to be using that a lot. And let's get your Sorceress, let's say... Hmm. You know what? The Burning Head... A little bit on the expensive side, but should be fairly useful against the Ungors, which are fairly weak. So, and the turn. Let's hope that Gallag doesn't jump over the Altar of Ultimate Darkness, and Hag Grief is going to attack Septic Claw, sure. Let's hope that Gallag doesn't jump over and head to Hark Cauldra, but honestly, if he takes it, we can catch him and destroy him anyway. Maybe it was a mistake to declare war on him, but he might provide us for a nice battle. Military access with Karant Kar? Sure thing. Alright, where are you going? You gonna besiege? Uh, you are going to besiege. Okay. Ambusher discovered. Torox. Where is Torox? Alright, huh, looks like he is going for Temple of Cain. Alrighty, we'll try to maybe trade Temple of Cain. Settlement besieged is fine. Malekith, you're going to head out of Rakdo, and you're going to head towards this. I guess the question is, will they attack us? For those who don't know, SFO is... Uh, uh, increases the likelihood of enemies actually attacking rather than besieging forever, which is pretty great. Malekith, I think you're gonna have to march stance all the way over here. Now, you are in range, but I'm willing to bet that this guy will run if we try to attack him here. 90% sure. Though, on the other hand... Hey, did I not click you? My bad. Uh, on the other hand... You are in march stance and low vigor... Is pretty bad in SFO as well. And there are significant debuffs. I guess we'll give it a try. Let's see what he does. I can't actually tell whether Malekith is in range or not, but he should be, right? And indeed he is. Yes, all right. Pyrrhic victory as well. We've got our cinematic battle, folks. A proper debut for everybody. Unfortunately, we have limited mana because Jeshia rather than Malekith here is going to attack, but that's fine. We should be able to handle it. Just got to be careful. Don't underestimate the Beastmen and SFO as uh, I, uh, I have PTSD with regards to fighting them in the early part of my Carl Franz campaign where they were just so threatening and almost destroyed his army of you times. Here we go. Alrighty, here we go. This one will be the proper debut for our uh, for our campaign, and we even have some helpers on the field this time: a Death Hag as well as a Sorceress, plus all the uh, garrison units. But of course, Malekith can't be trusting the Sorceresses, as their uh, as their loyalty lies more with Morathi than they do with than it does rather with Malekith. So he'll always have to watch out for knives or fire bolts or dark bolts, doom bolts to the back. Anyway, anyway, uh, we are going to speed up through this as we will have some time to get the rest of our army on the field, but it will be a dangerous battle. Uh, yes, the enemy's army is mostly Primarily, I should say, composed of Ungors, though they do have some Gores as well as some Beastmen and Warhounds. However, we have that Vigor loss reduction from the uh, uh, from the March Stance. And as I've mentioned, in SFO, Vigor loss is incredibly dangerous and uh, much more important than it is in Vanilla. So we will have to be careful by virtue of that. Fortunately, we should be able to use the uh, Dread Spears and whatever other units we got from the Garrison in order to take our hits for us because, well, at least for a little time, and because obviously we don't particularly care whether they live or die. Alrighty, and the uh, the fake HDR is really showing in this particular uh, map. It's certainly making the snow a little bit uh, a little bit brighter and the darks a little bit darker. I'm not entirely sure it's a good thing or not, but it is making the battle look a little bit more fantastic. Anyway, uh, the battle will begin here as our Cold One chariots have moved up and they're going to go ahead and start annoying the enemy by uh, using their bolt throw well not bolt throwers but the crossbows rather. 
and firing away. Now, these are cold one chariots, so they're not going to do a lot of damage, uh, especially not compared to something like a Scourge Runner chariot. Although 131 missile strength is high, or it seems like it's high, as we can see, it's barely doing any damage to these Beastmen Warhounds. And in fact, that took, what, 10 to 15% of our ammunition already? And these guys have barely taken any damage whatsoever. 8406. I just want to see. 8406. So a couple shots will only... Yeah, they, it's just a tiny amount of trickle damage, and not a single model has died either. There we go, finally. And just as I talk about it, one dies, but uh, yeah, you can't rely on these things for range damage, but the range damage on these chariots is just secondary to the fact that they're a, uh, a melee sort of chariot anyway. Anyway, anyway, the goal here is to hopefully annoy the enemy army enough to kick the anthill and force them towards us, and it does seem that we are indeed successful at it. This works very well for us as uh, Malekith, great general as he is will obviously employ the terrain here and we have some damn solid terrain to make use of a massive amount of impassable objects here with these two plateaus around the uh, river valley here are uh, going to force the enemy armless arm army essentially to funnel itself uh, down towards our army where we can hopefully distract a lot more units with uh, fewer units of our own also malika taking a dunk there yeah, enjoying the uh, enjoying the cold on your feet. Probably used to that, but maybe it helps him. What with being burned all over and everything. I actually wonder if the uh, if his armor is air slash water type. <laughs> water type. I can I can just kind of picture him like angrily walking along the uh, like falling off his dragon and just like angrily walking along like a riverbed or like the or like the sea just like on the bottom there. <laughs> uh, just kind of sauntering through that. Just go to Ulthwan the. Uh, by foot. Anyway, I'm getting distracted again. Here come the enemies. We're gonna send our basic units forward from the garrison, because once again, we don't care about them. Uh, the uh, withering fire from the Dark Shards, I'm sure, is going to help at least dish out a decent amount of damage, but the spell work here is where the real damage is gonna come from. First, we're going to pop a chill wind on the enemy, and then we're gonna go ice and fire, as a burning head is going to move through all of these Zungors, and look at it exploding them wherever they uh, wherever it touches them fantastic all right and this seems like it's gonna work out real well because it's hitting so many units at the same time and exploding them into gobbets of bloody meat bloody and scorched meat I should say and not only that but the burning head will rebound off of the uh, uh, off of the far bank and hit another unit a second time beautiful Alrighty, well done everybody, and now march forward. In fact, just out of curiosity, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Five units essentially completely destroyed with the casting of a single spell. Huh. Sorceress, 507 kills and 35,000 damage. That is, uh, that's very good for a level one or two or three. I don't know. Very low level sorceress. Alrighty, in the meantime, the enemy Beast Lord has been found by Malekith here, and they're going to get into a little bit of a duel. We are going to, however, send the Death Hag together with our uh, with our Black Guard to help kill the Beast Lord just that little bit faster. Granted, Malekith could take him on his own, I am sure. However, the faster the Beast Lord dies, the faster we get that morale shock to the rest of his army for doing this. Alrighty, well, they can rip him apart. In the meantime, since the essentially the entire enemy uh, center line collapsed with a single spell, honestly, I think the entire battle was essentially won with that single spell. The enemy only has units remaining at the uh, at the flanks, although they clearly failed to move here, and we were able to withdraw more units from the center to help out both of the flanks as well, where the enemy is failing to get through. And I'm sure that their lord will be dead soon, and that's going to be even more morale damage. Yeah, I, I have noticed that there is definitely some texture issues on these uh, snowy maps in Nagaron sometimes. Definitely see some uh, uh, some more flickering on the blood and some other things than I would perhaps expect in a few other places. But that's uh, that's been a bug since forever. I don't even remember Total Warhammer without the uh, a blood flicker bug on the ground. So I'm going to have to get used to that. I don't think it's my graphic settings in that particular case. Anyway, it looks like the enemy flanks have 
collapse and with the death of the enemy lord it looks like most of the army has broken one more unit of gores and one more unit of ungores are going to come back and charge towards us but the dread spirit not bleak swords bleak swords should be able to hold lowborn though they may be I always like to make a point that I find it funny that uh, the Dark Elves treat their Lowborn better than the uh, Bretonians do. And I mean significantly better. I mean, Lowborn Dark Elves still have, uh, still have plenty of rights. Alrighty. Uh, as long as they don't mess with the highborn anyway, just like real life. Uh, anyway, there we go with that. The gores and ungores are shattered and the battle is over. Malekith is relatively unharmed, or at the very least so little that uh, he should heal up over the end turn. And most of the damage, or at least the brunt of it, was taken by our garrison units. So that should be really helpful. We gotta give the MVP in this particular battle to our sorceress Hegren, who, uh, who managed to essentially rout the enemy army with a single spell. Well, swell. All right, no problem at all, and 507 slaves for that was not too bad at all either. Swell. Uh, we'll obviously enslave as it would be pointless to... Well, the ransom wouldn't be pointless, but uh, the other thing very much would be. Unfortunately, you were going to run away. And, oh, we got a forbidden rod for Malekith as well. Absolutely amazing. Probably the uh, best thing we could have gotten out of that. Uh, if Jeshia leaves, just out of curiosity... Yes, Malekith would be able to enter the Altar of Ultimate Darkness. Beautiful. And you can start getting mana while Malekith heals up a little bit more there. I suppose we could have Jeshia recruit some more uh, basic units, but... Eh. Uh, Ripper Horn Tribe, you want to join us? Ooh, actually getting close to being able to do that. All right, come on, Gromby. Come on, man. <laughs> we got to get on friendlier turns with him before he... Uh, uh, before he finishes up fighting with everybody else. And I doubt that Torox is any kind of threat to Nagarond, so that should be fine. Alrighty, outpost available, gonna ignore it. Let's send the turn. I imagine this guy's going to try to run. I doubt that he's going to try to attack Malekith again, because that would be crazy. Although, maybe if Malekith's by himself, we could try to set up an ambush here. We shall see. I probably could have double-checked diplomacy again, but uh, we're probably okay. And ambush by the... Huh. Well, that's interesting. Uh, how did he get around us? Well, unfortunately, I think Jesh is dead. I'm going to quickly move around this. I don't really understand how he managed to do this, though. Yes, I, I understand that he has the... Uh, he has the ambush stance, but what I don't understand is how he got around the settlement. Because the settlement exerts a zone of control that you can't move. Unless he has a sort of ambush stance that is derived from the uh, from the beast paths. Kind of like Village's teleportation ambush stance, which I wasn't aware of if it is in fact the case. Well, either way, well, let's see what he does off of this. And honestly, if that is in fact the case, this is going to cost us this lord, but no items and nothing else, and we really don't care about that. Uh, we're going to try to run away, maybe cast a few spells if we can. I wonder if we're deployed close or relatively close to the uh, escape area. And obviously I'm going to do this manually, because otherwise it's a waste of time. Alright, come on now. Where is the deployment area? Alrighty, and it is... Uh, all right, well, I guess we're gonna try to go this way. Yeah, it's not gonna work. All righty, that's fine. You're gonna get trapped. We're gonna... Oh, we're gonna lose a potion of strength, but uh, whatever. Let's cast... Okay, never mind. <laughs> she routed so quickly. But if he has no way to escape now, he's screwed. Which is just fine. Well, I guess no harpy, Lord. A little bit of a... Uh... A little bit of an investment there, but if we didn't have the Lord, we probably wouldn't have had that easy of a time attacking you. Alright, do that. Then... What? Wait, what? I thought that you would have been destroyed. But okay, whatever, just just die, just die. I don't wanna I don't wanna waste the time again. And yes, he's stuck there, which means Malekith now gets to kill him. Septic Claw and Clad and Septic has been destroyed, so is Clark Caron. That means Torox has done his thing. And Temple of Cain has been taken by Gromby. 
Huh, wait, is there nobody at Troctac Mount? I wonder. I do indeed wonder. Uh, we'll have to send somebody down there, but right now that's not important. Druki, first strike. On to you, Mr. Cornash. And you're gonna run, but you ain't gonna run around the mountain, right? Right now you're not gonna run around the mountain, which means you're dead. And we'll be fighting a lot more beastmen as we, I guess, are gonna head down to Torox. Maybe we'll get a temporary lord to see what's going on at Shroctak Mount, just in case, because if we can colonize it and trade it to Gromby, it might work. Honestly, this whole gambit of trading him stuff might not work at all, but who knows? Who knows? I don't like that he's not at war with anybody right now, though. What about Ripperhorn? Yes. We gotta keep him fighting. Because otherwise, if he's not at war with anybody, he'll likely declare war on us. I'd really love to have dwarven allies. Wouldn't it be neat? All right, Malekith attack Cornash and low casualties, decisive victory. We don't unfortunately have our other army to take the hits anymore. But I think one more cinematic battle to round out this episode. Yes, a misery for all. <laughs> What a line. What a line. Anyway, here we go again and in a very dark map this time around. At least we are getting some uh, some variety in terms of the uh, types of maps that we're getting. And once again, it seems like the land itself, Nagaroth itself, stands with us as once again we have a very nice, uh, uh, very nice setup in terms of terrain. An impassable bit of plateau over on our rightmost flank will protect that flank from getting hit by warhounds and other fast-moving units. And then the rest of our Dread Spear line is deployed on the far side of this uh, riverbank, meaning that the enemy will have to ford the river, being slowed down by the water, all the while suffering shots from our dark shards, and then be forced uphill slightly into the uh, into the waiting Dread Spears and Malekith in front of them all as well. I generally don't particularly like these dark battles because you can't see the glorious spectacle of it all, but you know, on occasion. And these battles are a lot better if you have, like, vampire counts or uh, something like that because of the glowing bale fire. So when you just see, like, their glowing eyes and stuff in the dark, it still makes for some uh, pretty neat shots. Maybe once we get, uh, like, uh, blood rack shrines and things like that, things that glow, it'll be a little bit better for the dark map. Ooh, Malekith lighting up the darkness with a cast, though, as a uh, chill wind comes down into several enemy uh, blobs and looks like all three will be forced into rout uh, by that single spell. We've also we used our Tormentor Sword to decent effect, stopping the Doom Bull in his place, or uh, in place rather, wherein he cannot contribute to the fight or apply his aura to uh, some of the other units on the flank. Uh, this will mean that the Ungors will fail and then only the Doom Bull will remain here, and he is already surrounded, though it is a little bit difficult to see him. And we're focusing him down with a couple of our units of uh, the uh, Dark Shards. In the meantime, since uh, the main battle uh, is going very well for us over in the center line. We have sent our units of Black Guard to anchor the line here. A burning head going to help them out by mowing down plenty of Ungors just like last time, since we know how effective it can be. And the Black Guard will start chasing them off. Looks like these guys don't really have much of a fight in them, and unsurprising, since we've already killed their lord. Uh, not in this battle, I mean, but uh, the uh, previous battle, and have already defeated them once. So they know that that it's unlikely that they're going to uh, win again. Although I suppose it's hard to say whether beastmen or regular rank-and-file beastmen are intelligent enough to be cognizant of the fact. Sure, their uh, their lords are, but uh, I don't know about the Ungors. They're probably just doing what they're told to not get eaten by gores or minotaurs or something, which, you know, fair enough. And they don't have much of a choice. Anyway, a little bit of a shootout going on between the Dark Shards and the Ungor Raiders. Fun fact, Ungor Raiders slightly outrange Dark Shards. I guess their little uh, uh, their little recurve bows are just that little bit uh, better at range than the Dark Shards crossbows are, which is a little bit surprising. But nonetheless... 
And this is, I guess, why we need Dark Shards with shields to be the front line, as our Dark Shards will take, I think, the most damage of any other uh, unit in the battle, though it'll be HP damage rather than unit losses, as we have lost a very few units. Anyway, with that, the Ungor Raiders are cleared out, though obviously the armor piercing is wasted on them, and I do believe the battle is pretty much ours. 90-95% in our favor, one other unit is fighting, it's a unit of Beastmen Warhounds, and they shan't be fighting for long. Yeah, damn, very, very dark map, though. It's too bad we couldn't fight here, but I don't think that we could have. I mean, I guess we could have deployed here, but uh, we had to make use of that river, right? Sometimes you get dark maps, it's the uh, it's the nature of the game. Plus, I guess for Nagaroth itself, it also makes sense, as I imagine Nagaroth occasionally does have polar nights. It is very far to the north, after all. Though I guess this isn't actually one of them, because we're just in the shadow of the mountains. Anyway, there we are with that. The battle is over. The enemy army is shattering, and to do our best to chase down whatever enemy units we can. The enemies, I think, uh... Morale, I should say, was pretty much broken in the previous battle, so they weren't, uh, they really weren't much of a challenge in this one, but we've got much more challenging beastmen soon, as we will have to head towards Torox. Torox? Torox. Alrighty, there we go. That should, I believe, destroy the faction. We can, I guess, replenish and get the slaves. We could also ransom, but you know what? We've got a decent amount of cash available right now, so uh, let's enslave them instead. And ooh, we're nearly halfway there to getting the 50 points that we needed to confederate our first ally. That was quick. I like it. Uh, enslave, please. I wish it was more captives from that but we don't have an easy way to chase the enemy yeah and a uh, chase the enemy down unfortunately uh what do we need we need the slave pen building in order to get our first black arc up and running which is one of you i take it where is that? Okay, yeah, we'll need to build that up probably immediately, specifically to do that. Anyway, with that, I do believe we're pretty much out of time, and I'm just going to call uh, the episode here. I uh, guess we're going to have to wait to find out whether Grimbrindle will declare war on us, or whether we can manage to... Uh, uh, to stay friendly with him. I guess one problem is that he's not going to like the other Dark Elves, but who knows? Who knows? Even if he starts fighting them, and we don't really care if he, as long as he stays allied with us, I guess. Next time, we'll probably push n up north towards Iron Frost and destroying the Mung, and then Valkia, who is up here and has actually started to work on the, uh, uh, on Grand. Although we could loop back around this way and take Valkia out instead of the Mung. I'll have to think about that, because I would think that Altar of Ultimate Darkness is well defended against the uh, onslaught of the Mung, whereas we're a little bit more exposed from Valkia's direction. And there is also, once again, Torox to consider and Hag Grief to retake, but, well, I guess we have options, at the very least. Uh, let's see oh, how far we can get uh, next time around and uh, how close we can get to the next Confederation. Stay tuned for more Malekith. Don't forget to leave a like and comment. All glory to the algorithm. And thanks for watching.